Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and even good tomorrow. Our world clocks would fill up a wall as we light up the globe with our 500 plus attendees. Would that I could teleport us to a big safe room somewhere. Now, I would like to say, or should I say, please sit quietly at your desks and open your books to the chapter entitled The Roles and Meanings of Digital Asset Management for Educational Institutions. That'd be fun. The seeds we plant today will serve to create both knowledge and community and to serve us far into the future. We welcome you to the world's first event ex devoted exclusively to education and digital asset management. We're here, we're online, of course, and also on course to have a lively day exclusively focused on educational institutions. While our presentations today are largely from universities and professional institutions, DAM's role at K through 12 institutions, both public and private, continues to unfold. At the same time, professional educational companies who live in the adjacencies of more formal learning, professional and technical schools, in-betweens like the great courses, content providers to education like the Studs Terkel archives, the extensive course offerings from the scientific, technical, medical and mathematical publishers, tax practice case law or case law from Walters Kalur as an example, and the educational training from professional associations such as the American Bar Association and lesser known specialized fields such as the National Board of Medical Examiners and the American Society of Appraisers who join us today. What a diverse and accomplished global community of professionals this represents. And as with our community joined here today, DAM comes, or it came, calling through door, more doors than we can imagine. Every institution is managing digital assets today. For some, as we know, this is the most general of statements and the word managing actually has no formal intentionality. For others, like the great majority of you who have joined us today at the conference, and we'll, as we'll hear from our speakers, DAM is a recognized and funded practice, perhaps in second or third generation software with sometimes 10 to 15 years of experience. And what are some of those doors where DAM came a calling? Campus or institutional photographers, libraries and archives were often the first knock at the DAM door along with, and we have to take a deep breath here, media technologists, public relations, marketing and admission staff, university or school athletic departments, buildings and grounds, grant and development officers, the band, the campus store, or the affiliation with e-commerce sites that provide class rings and clothing, the theater, the museums, and well, what about all those learning materials? guest lectures and student materials. Sometimes this list and getting it straight for our institutional management can seem like the Harry Potter staircases. One thing gets settled and set and then some nefarious force moves the steps all around. Hogwarts has nothing on us. Now, if only we could have the AI engines generate correct condition profiles and these AI engines would make sure the right digital assets went to the sorting hat, which had all the pictures and videos of the rooms and, well, I digress, maybe in the future. The impact of the digital world was moving quickly before the pandemic focused our attention to teaching in an exclusively digital world. For our damn day together, we explore what was already underway, the meaning of digital outside the classroom. We pose the question, with all of these possibilities for DAM, where do we start? We assert as a fact that all are part of a vibrant and growing understanding of using DAM in an integrated approach throughout the institution. DAM serves the enterprise, and soon an educational operations without a well-structured DAM will be the rare exception, in jeopardy of some sort, and likely to fall behind in attracting students, faculty, staff, and resources that help make the mark and measure an institution's arc of digital capability. 
Educational senior executives know that a common starting point in their damn journey is often image management and the campus marketing materials. Yet we know at the same time, assets are being created everywhere. Almost everything today is born with a digital twin. Learning to look at DAM from an enterprise point of view can mean both efficiency and impact, and it can be really hard. Developing an institutional approach to this potential points us with laser focus at a big chalkboard with columns labeled technology, people, process, budget, and governance. All of these will be explored today. In technology, who runs or walks these systems or trips over them sometimes? And note I used the plural form of the word. We've gone from a crank start to a Tesla in DAM and there is no end in sight. With DAM, this means managing the binaries, the metadata, the interfaces and connections with other systems and understanding this is a kinetic and elastic ecosystem. Beware the over infatuation with any certain technology, e.g. today cloud, because the next cloud is always coming and the often illusory sirens call a free or build it yourself. People, well, here's an easy one, maybe not. So many of your colleagues can and will be involved in DAM, discovering your allies, managing the challenges of late adopters who are convinced a shared drive or at their desk drawer is the best approach to file management, new employee onboarding, changes to how DAM works, new departments, new operations, people like words matter. Process, regardless of where DAM starts, one can rest assured that when the next department starts to use DAM, we need an empathic approach to the no one sized workflow fits all truth. Managing this diversity is perhaps the trickiest wicket and so important. Budget, none of this happens without funding. From the initial investment to navigating the oft perilous waters of grant or one-time funding, evolving DAM into an enterprise infrastructure application, just like accounting, except our assets are digital coins, is always our heads up display that we look at while we drive ahead. And finally, governance. If juggling seems like fun with balls, bowling pins, bowling pins and blazing torches, just wait for damn. Governance is the art of streamlining the more every day, say changes to the metadata model, along with institutionalizing the enterprise oversight of DAM as it embraces the institution with ubiquity. As we get started, Let's set the broad basis for why we are here and the outcomes we seek in educational institution. First, return on investment, our most traditional conversation with executives. We think of this as table stakes. And our provocative question is, do you ever revisit ROI and walk the, back the cat to tie the actualities of what happened with what you told the CFO? Number two, return on initiative. In our world of educational institutions, museums, libraries, archives, and service organizations, we measure our impact by our mission and our mandate, not by profit and loss. For DAM, we tie our investment to looking at our charters. Do we better service our students and our educational missions? Our provocative question here is, how do we measure achieving better the outcomes we are here to serve? And finally, return on information. We live in a data-centric world. Our DAM consistence contain data which can be conceptualized separately from the metadata. Our provocative question, can we use the data that we generate in DAM as an information asset that helps us to better accomplish our mission? DAM doesn't stop when the school bell rings or the books or the Zoom close. The semester ends, the cap and gown go quietly to the rest to rest until next year. Damn, never stops. Digital doesn't know summer school or spring break. The institutional digital doors are always open and welcoming an engaged and growing world. We review today the challenges and solutions, 
DAM has the potential to support and enhance all that an ed educational institution does. We will hear from one of our oldest universities, Yale, 1701, and one of our newest and most innovative Western Governors Universities, and see how they embrace digital despite an age difference of close to 300 years. We value the help of our community, and we hope to create and deepen that more today. We do so in tandem with our lead sponsors, our exhibitors, our deeply experienced consultants, and with the staff from Henry Stewart, who work with unfailing courtesy and focus for all of us here today. And as we start the day, if you want to catch up on sessions from the first two days of Dam Industry Week, click the relevant dates on the left-hand side of the agenda tab. Don't forget to click on the exhibition tab throughout the event to check on sponsor booths and be in with the chance of winning great prizes. Also, take a look at the competitions tab where you can win free access to one of the Henry Stewart online educational courses and the community feed where you can post questions for all and polls for all attendees. During sessions, we encourage you to chat with fellow attendees and of course, make the most of our expert lineup by submitting your questions using the panel on the right side of your screen. And if you need any help during the event, you can turn to assistance from the Henry Stewart team by using the chat box at the bottom of the screen. And with this context and those few housekeeping rules, it's now my pleasure to introduce Lewis King. Lewis, who I've known for quite a few years, has, is the enterprise an enterprise architect at Yale University. He works to align technology strategies at the university with people who get to use them. He brings a deep and broad experience in enterprise solutions for teaching, learning, a commitment to cultural heritage, and a skill at administration. Lewis, it's been a delight to get ready to welcome you here today these past few weeks and to be spending time with you again. Thanks for your contribution. Thank you, David, for the generous uh, introduction. I appreciate it. I am so excited to be here for Dam Industry Week and particularly to talk about effective dam strategies in higher education. Today, I wanted to go and cherry pick different strategies that came up along my own dam journey. To give you some context, I started with digital asset management when I had my own advertising agency. I does marketing communications, and we transform the organization from analog to digital workflows. I have experience doing rich media and moving media and animation work and enlighten. Um, and there we had to have, you know, advanced digital workflows for the technologies that we had at the time. At the University of Michigan, I managed creative teams that worked on software titles for improving teaching and learning experiences using rich and scalable uh, media architectures. At Yale University, I've had the opportunity to work on digital transformation of the cultural heritage arena, and now working as enterprise architect, digital transformations across the higher education framework. I broke the strategies into three groups launch, grow, and mature. So let's look at some of the launch strategies. First is this idea of having an anchor tenant. One of the most difficult things to create in these environments is sustainability. And one of the best ways to create sustainability is to make sure that you have anchor tenants who are returning to those departments the value of the investments that they're making. It's very difficult to have a dam initiative trying to coalesce all of the smaller tenants into a sustainable resource to aggressively move forward with a dam program and to be effective. When I came to Yale University, there was a deep commitment from three museums, a significant commitment from the library, a provostial investment, and most of all, community buy-in. These were key factors in the success that we've had. But it's also important not just to think about the money, but to think about 
a holistic view, zoom out at the entirety of the enterprise and think about where you need to have an impact. We use this simplified diagram of an ecosystem, which depicts the idea of the community, the content, the practice and the technology all intersecting in a complex and interconnected system. So thinking about how you are going to invest in each of these areas is a critical strategy. More specifically, initial dam, implement, dam implementations worked on trying to aggregate the diverse technical resources across the university into a platform. And in so doing, we could save money, you know, eliminate some redundancy and take the technology burden off of the user base. And all of that was very true. But as we matured, we learned that actually that platform is a driver for change in the community. It allows the community to transform their practices to be more effective, more innovative, and more focused on scholarship, the actual mission of the university, research, teaching and learning, collections, uh, clinical practice, and the like. At the scale that you're working across an enterprise, though, you can't think of it of accommodating every aspect and every need of that ecosystem or the enterprise in one fell swoop. You'll need to think of a phased approach to to um, grow the capacity. And to that end, it's important in that phase approach to think about your investment in each of the lobes of the um, ecosystem. In fact, when we started, for instance, at Yale, we started with the museums and libraries and then moved out to media producers and ultimately to teachers and learners. That was the phased approach that we're thinking, but also content. We started with images and didn't move into audio and video until a second phase. So thinking about how you'll orchestrate this over time is a critical strategy. Now, when you think about the community, yes, we want the tenants, we want the investment and the political part of the community to weigh in. But critically, we also want to focus on a central investment in the collaboration of the community of practice. The community of practice is spread across the organization, and they have oftentimes little opportunity to connect with each other. But if we can invest centrally in making that connection, then we can leverage what they know and what they bring to the table across the entire community. Here we have one of our key partners from the Peabody Museum of Natural History demonstrating to other practitioners how they automatically digitize books with this machine that automatically does it behind. Here you can see there are cameras mounted at the top. And the book is put on a platen and pages are automatically turned, generating in the end spreads that are stitched together into digital representations of the book. Content, one of the lobes of the ecosystem is also critical. Here we're depicting a simple video, although is it really that simple? What are all the pieces of video? Do we understand everything that's needed? Do we understand every channel of metadata? Do we clearly understand the expectations of the community and what is needed? Well, that's important, very important in order to divide, to produce the capabilities that are needed. However, in higher ed, it goes beyond the traditional audio, video, image and document assets. We have all kinds of specialized imaging that comes off of specialized equipment that we use um, in, in our research and scholarship. These are complex assets, and we have to know technically how we're going to handle them. We also have data, gobs of data, and data frequently doesn't want to be handled in the same way that a media asset does, largely because the data is often in structured hierarchies, stored on volumes, you know, on, on file systems. And it wants to stay that way, and we want it to stay that way in order that 
uh, we can use it to the best of our ability across the paradigm. So in this, we did a quick look at the different formats that were being used across the university um, for data formats. We gave up at about 350 formats. I mean, there are a lot of formats that need to be considered. And then we think about things like 3D modeling and 3D imaging and the different, there, are, there is some standardization now in this area, but there are also some brand new uh, formats being created by the research that we do. How are we going to handle those? How do those get managed? What are the key requirements of managing them? And complex objects. We have objects that have many different parts and are packaged in different formats of packaging. How do we parse those packages? How do we render these complex digital objects? These are tough questions that need to um, be addressed. And that's why it's important as a strategy to scope your assets, to scope the content that you're going to be able to work with. So as we look at that, one of the early promises of digital asset management, or thoughts at least, was that we could aggregate everything into a, sim a simple single system, and that would manage every asset across the entire university. And what we found when we looked at these different digital objects is that not every digital object wants to be managed in the same way. They require different workflows. And in some cases, they require different digital asset management systems in order to streamline those workflows. So in this example, we see that we have put at Yale a different digital asset management system for digital preservation as we did for media management for the communications people. There's a relationship to be between these systems. In fact, the whole enterprise is connected through metadata, but we're able to provide the specific capability for these kinds of content by having two different systems. And that's a big plus. And when we think about the technology that underpins this, we think about the capabilities and how they're organized. What, what system has primary responsibility for what capability? And we tease that out and we design that. So here are the architecture flows from ingest on the, la on the left to management activities next, flowing into our delivery capabilities and then access through different environments of the university. And when we leverage the community, we also think about how can we use the community to tell us what the priorities are. One of the most complicated aspects of running digital asset management in a higher university is that there are a lot of desired outcomes out there. Uh, as you think about a strategy, you're oftentimes trying to reflect on what are the two or three most important priorities that we have for advancing our approach. And to do that, we need to get the answer from the room, from the room of practitioners, where these ideas together can be placed in front of everybody for discussion and can be prioritized and a direction can be set. And since we're gonna ask the community to set the direction and to continue to reset the direction as we mature and it becomes clearer what's most important to the institution, we also need to be constructing the systems and designing the systems to be agile and flexible so that we could grow and evolve along with the community. These are many of the principles that we have in our design approach for keeping that kind of flexible flexibility in place. So we have it set up. We've had some basic principles that have a working sustainable enterprise moving. We have people coming in um, and we have a great set of capabilities we're able to deliver. How do we then grow to an enterprise? One of the first things to look at 
is whether we're growing on the academic side of the house or the administrative side of the house. And this is important because there are really two decision making structures that go on. Uh, some people describe the academic side decision making as organized anarchy structure um, and the administration as a, a typical hierarchical structure. In the organized anarchy structure, it's not always clear how the decisions will be made. And in fact, decisions are often made by results on how effective they see something you know, that's in play. So therefore, on the ac academy side, we're really trying to foster adoption. We're trying to get people to come in at their own volition because they see the value of this capability in their work. And so fostering the adoption is then put in front of the decision makers to say, don't we want more of this? Can this help the mission even further? Whereas on the administrative side, we're looking at a department, let's say a communications department, and saying, how can we be more effective in the department? How can we transform our practice into something that is a stronger digital practice than it traditionally was? And in this area, we could get the departments to agree to the funding and planned growth of the uh, solution over time. But in both cases, we must remember that the end user experience is everything. We need to drive the change management, manage the change, and support people through the transformation to these new approaches. As we think about user experience, one of the uh, most profound strategies that we've come across is that you can really look at two dimensions to ascertain the type of user experience that you're trying to deliver. One of those is whether the users are working in communication or scholarship. And the second is whether they're working as professionals or as constituents. And I think communication versus scholarship is pretty clear and scholarship we are, it is a rather broad area of teaching, learning, research, professional practice, those types of things. In communications, it's largely the communications departments and the web presence um, and those outward facing uh, assets. By professional, we mean people who are in their title described as working with media. It could be collection manager, photographer, um, uh, an exhibits person in the museums, uh, any type of media management person. And constituent is anybody in the university who's doing another type of activity that uses media. They could be very, very professional in the way that they use media, but they're still a constituent if they're teaching using very high quality media. That's still a constituent. So if you look at these, you're really trying to create four different classes of user experience based on those dimensions. And that plays out in interesting ways if you, could, if you think this out for a strategy. What we've done is here's the four dimensions, the use case dimensions down here to remind you, but we've color coded our architecture. So essentially these systems up here are systems for professional scholarship professional communications, and in the upper right, this is um, scholarship for constituents and constituent communication. And by doing this, you see some, maybe some duplication. For instance, we have a consumer dam and a professional dam. Um, that's an important aspect to think about that you might want to uh, have some replicated or duplicated, but connected, technologies in order that you can configure them to the needs of the community. One, the professional community who's producing to deadlines, and the other is the constituent community that's accessing those assets and using it within their own workflows. But as you think about the user experience, it's also important, particularly in a university where departments can be of 
vastly different scales to not encumber them with a one size fits all. And in fact, we learned that in the area of ingest of preparing assets coming from a workbench or media production facility into the digital asset management environment, that we're best leaving those workflows alone. You know, we could see that we were going to start making enemies there uh, as people were very uh, tight about the workflows that they wanted to do. But it was really because in one unit, they have 25 steps to approval. In another unit, they have two. And they don't want to be encumbered by the technology, but to have the technology free them. So this kind of thing where you externalize idiosyncratic uh, processes can be okay as long as in our case what we did is we made sure that we had very clear cut standards for what entry into the dam looks like what are the metadata what are the approved uh formats what are the processes and packaging that we have in place those all have to be met but if you meet the standards then you come into the aggregate in force so you could be growing and things could be going all along quite well, and there could still be disruptions. And we found that over time at the Office of Digital Assets and Infrastructure, the university had shifted. New head of IT came in, a new head of library, there were shifts in the museums, the provost had left and a new provost was installed. And in this maturing enterprise, we also had the stress of the 2009 crash. Those things a few years later conflated into a decision by the university to maintain the success, but to return the component parts back to the existing organizations uh, who, where the people were coming from. And so people went into the library and into the museums, um, into communications and into the IT organization and maintained across these organizations um, a, a, the service that was going on and continued to grow it. During this time, while there was still a reset going on around leadership, <clears throat> we asked the senior leadership whether we could continue to support the community of practice because this was a, a rich part of the investment. And they, they said yes. We did another round of strategic planning because it was the right time and developed a strategic plan. And what was really great as we looked to mature in this next phase was that the university reconstituted the effort as a part of a larger effort. A deputy provost was installed uh, to oversee this kind of collaboration. The collaboration would be much larger it would include things like facilities, storage areas, um, conservation facilities, and those things. So the entire collaboration was expanded, Dan being part of it. And the strategy was embraced by this new leadership group. But as we looked at the new paradigm, we realized that we now had to make very difficult decisions and set priorities over different departments, across different departments. And therefore it was important to put a strong governance model that would help guide us in being able to make those decisions. We also needed to have a funding model that would work. Since now, I mean, we kind of shifted from being tenants to actually having condos, you know? Uh, it's still the same deal. The bigger players have to finance what's needed here largely and sustain it. Um, but we needed a model to understand how are we going to finance this across all of the players. And in doing this, we also realized that now our services are coming out of different departments of the university. So how do we think about across all of those departments, how do we measure the success that we're having with the service? And we started to build a framework for that. So. With all of that in place, with those strategies in place, our focus in the cultural heritage space is to develop LUX, a cross-collection search and discovery that will unify the user experience across the entire collections of Yale. And since they will be 
use international standards, we expect these content to be able to be aggregated and used for scholarship and communications, including all collections of the world that are uh, available in these standards. And so this is very exciting to think that we could aggregate not only with Harvard's collections, but with the Vatican's collections or other world renowned institutions. Uh, to do this, we have grant funding to rationalize descriptive med metadata, as David said, over 300 years, not everything's described exactly the same way, and APIs to make sure that this foundational platform is accessible to lightweight applications that could drive research and scholarly work. In the communications area, we have uh, three different dam implementations that are segmented to particular markets and tied into particular web presences, uh, one of which is a shared uh, environment by central communications to bring, bring in smaller departments. And then finally, we have found that in the teaching and learning arena, faculty and research one institutes generally don't reuse other people's components, other faculty's components. And so we have worked on focusing in improving management skills of digital media within the environments that we have, the course management system and various collaboration tools. And we're looking as the new Lux rolls out to integrate that the course management system would be an endpoint to all of our collections. Just as an overview, and you really need as a community, you need to, to secure, I just keep stressing this, secure your key tenants. Um, you need to understand the content and scope it so that everybody is clear what you are and what you aren't supporting. You need to leverage the community of practice to understand the practice and to prioritize the investments in the digital asset management environment. And you need to have a technology that is prepared to evolve as the practice of the community evolves as well. And that's what I have today. Thank you very much. Lewis, thanks so much for putting that presentation together. It's been such a pleasure to see the arc of capability unfold and increase and change at Yale over these years. And, and you've made such a contribution to that. We've got a few minutes for questions and, and oddly enough, some questions have come in. Uh, one interesting one, I, I, kind of, I kind of like this, was could you, could you share memories of a couple of things that surprised you about DAM? And what an interesting question, you know, to think back about, oh, oh, that, you know, so what do you think? I, I was really surprised that DAM wouldn't be that central comprehensive solution. Mm -hmm. I think early on, we had a vision for DAM that was one built on a construct of how we understood technology in those days where you built it and centralized it and that aggregation was mm -hmm. helpful. But in today with the way the technology went in the diversity of offerings in the cloud and the efficiency, we really see that different damn systems might be a better approach if you could figure out how to relate the content across them. And that was a big surprise. And the second big surprise was the community practice just surprises me every day. It is amazing the amount of skill that we have around us. And if we just stop and listen, you know, every day of your life, you'll have something new to learn. I suspect that translates all the way up to the desired outcomes that you mentioned too, that they continue to aggregate and resynthesize and recontour themselves as, as time goes on and opportunities open up. We had a question from one of our, the smaller institutions that joined us today and was curious, was appreciative of your segmenting the, the professional, the, the, the matrix with professional and consumer style of users and then the further parsing that you did in that. And have you, and the question was, is asked, have you had experience architecturally in being able to make that division, if you will, kind of be partitioned within one of the dams that you're using, kind of for a smaller institution? 
I think we really struggled with that. So there's two parts to that equation. One is how big overall, mm -hmm. how complex overall is the problem, the people problem, you know, the, the different, the diverse outcomes that people are trying to drive. And I think if in a smaller institution, you might see less diverse outcomes, in which case that may be possible. What ultimately happens in an institution at a large scale is that the configuration gets more expensive than the redundancy of a separate system. And so I don't think that's necessarily a mantra for you to take, but to, to if you think about your use cases, ask yourself, can I drive both of these use cases in this system? And I think in smaller institutions, you'll find the answer is yes. Yeah, that's a, a, a nice set of insights to help give some guidance on that. Thank you for that. Had another question come in about usage and governance of cultural versus administrative data. Probably kind of maybe keying a little bit out, off of Lux and then a little bit off of the more kind of everyday damn usage that you outlined in the matrix. Uh, they're different. They're definitely different. We have administrative guidelines for data retention. Uh, you know, there's there's large policy in place for that, and we need to put that in place for that. Um, and the cultural heritage, they have their own policies. Each of these cultural heritage organizations may have their own policies, although we have converged on some. So for instance, we have an open access policy. And so that is a complex piece of management, certainly around access and governance of these assets. I should mention that uh, things like FERPA also put an entirely different swing on what the requirements are. So all of those requirements need to be managed and you are working with different leadership groups to find what the regulatory constraints or policy constraints are for those. Among the different constituent groups, we had another, another question come in that we could take the rest of the day to talk about. Um, about adoption, inclusion, collaboration, about territorial issues, and the the gentle art of persuasion or head knocking um, in terms of gathering for adoption. Any broad in this last couple of minutes that we have? Any broad uh, thoughts about the journey that you've had to have this become entity embraced? I, I think what really happened there is that we had that. I mean, the Office of Digital Assets and Infrastructure was a disruption to the status quo, but it also accelerated the, the opportunity in digital. Mm -hmm. However, that disruption, because we didn't get the funding to go as fast as we wanted, that disruption ended up being other units, IT and library, caught up in digital, right? And we were able to think of a different framework for it as we went forward. So the thing that, that made it so successful was that we worked with the community of practice and we built trust across the sort of tension of the political ownership and turf. You know, we really all, I mean, to the credit of everybody in the institution, everybody was focused on bringing what they had to the table and considering what other people had and what they needed. And once we got there, the sky was the limit. We could erode the traditional turf wars and work together to move forward. And I think on that note, you have our thanks for helping the community worldwide go forward with the leadership that you provided in digital asset management. And hopefully looking forward, perhaps, Next April, we can greet Spearing with even more insight and understanding to what Yale is doing and, and the, the aegises of opportunity that you represent. Lewis, thanks so much. Really Thank appreciate you. it. You bet.